Hello guys, welcome to lesson number 65 in our series Drawing Techniques for Beginners. Last lesson we started plotting out our supercar and um, I've, uh, I've taken out the grid and I've just strengthened up some of the lines. I've, I've taken some of the value out of <clears throat> some of the areas that are nearest the reflections. I've just added some more detail in there. Uh, I think this is going to be quite a tricky drawing, um, so bear with it. I know some of you over on the group I felt a little overwhelmed with it, but um, let's just stick with it and just see how we go. I'm going to be using the uh, HB pencil to start with today in these darker areas. So we're going to really start to bring out some of these dark areas there. Uh, and I will definitely be using the black pencil, uh, colored pencil in these areas. It's very important that we decide where the darkest areas and the highlights are. We really need to protect this shine here in the middle. I think that's possibly along with a bit along the roof there they're probably our two main highlights and then the darkest areas obviously within the window so without further ado I've sharpened up the HB pencil and um, I'm going to get to work underneath this wheel trim uh, or this wheel arch I guess it is uh, I've decided to go in with the HB pencil rather than the 2H to start with I think that you're going to be able to see it a little bit better on the on the video itself but I don't need to fill the tooth of the paper too much there because I am going to go in with the coloured pencil. I use a Faber-Castell Polychromos uh, coloured pencil. So I'm just going to give this a good layer. We'll go up with the, uh, the 2B in there as well as we go on. But I really want to get the foundations down today in today's lesson these darker areas, the very darkest areas, and then we can work from those into the rest of the region. If this is the first time that you visited my channel, thanks so much for clicking on the thumbnail, it means a lot to me. Um, I've designed this series to really try and take you through the stages that I went through uh, as a, a beginner myself, right through to, I think I'm, I'm kind of getting there. I wouldn't say I'm a complete or the finished article. I don't think anybody ever is. I think we're always learning and it's fantastic how much you can learn from others. Even when your art is up to a level that you're kind of happy with. And I'm sort of there now. I do sell some of my art, but I wanted to put together a series of drawing tutorials to kind of show you what I went through and was able to do in a short space of time. Like I say, it, it's taken me a good three to four years to get to a level where I feel comfortable being able to sort of describe the techniques and the the ways in which I go about creating realism in my art. Uh, and like I say, this is lesson 64 now. I guess I was very similar to what you guys are doing currently where you search around YouTube and, and have a look at certain videos and, and get ideas from one place and another and, and try and put them all together. And I've got a, a cupboard full of art supplies, which would really show you the kind of journey that I've been on. I've tried everything, charcoal, coloured pencils. I've bought some very expensive alcohol markers, some Copic markers they're called. Uh, and I've just really just thrown myself into it. And um, I've learnt a lot on the way. But I wanted to put this series together so that we could draw together. Because I think it's quite a lonely pursuit at times when we're doing our art. It's uh, late nights. So or if, if you're anything like me, it's late nights. It's uh, ploughing lots of hours into it. And it's a solitary thing. I do I do think there's it warrants merit um in practicing together. I guess that's why things like uh, art classes are are so useful and so popular. Now I'm using something called a tapered stroke. I'm I'm not scribbling on the paper. If you want to get a real grasp of the techniques that we're using, have a look at the link above you. Uh, it's called Essential Pencil Skills and it's sort of lessons one to six. And what I do is I outline the techniques of layering that I use, how we fill the tooth of the paper and the stroke that we use, but it's actually called a tapered stroke. So what I'm doing is I'm 
I'm pulling the pencil towards me. I'm never pushing away. And I'm layering to give me a very rich tone and very rich saturation. Now, one thing that I do not use is I don't use blending stumps. I don't use tissue paper uh, or, or Q-tips or anything like that to blend the actual drawing itself. The only time I would ever consider anything like that is sometimes adding a light background uh, or if I had a cloudy background, I would use a, a soft tissue paper just to move some of the graphite around. The only thing that I would ever use really during my actual work itself on the actual portrait or the the main bulk of the picture is I use a very soft brush. I use a two inch soft brush. It's very similar to a makeup brush uh, and that just moves the graphite around. The pencils that I use are called Karen Dash Graphwood. They're readily available throughout the world. I got mine from Amazon. And I guess again, a little bit like what some of you will be going through now. I went through a stage where I was trying various different paper, I was trying different pencils, and I believed that, or I held the belief that that was what was going to make me into a better artist. And although the pencils and the paper does make a slight difference, it's actually the skills that you're learning that is going to make the big, biggest impact. So I settled on these Karen Dash Graphwood pencils and to be you know, quite honest with you, I'm happy enough with them. They, uh, they do me the, the job that's required. And the more I use them, the more I get used to them and I find out their limitations and their strengths. The paper that I use is called Strathmore Bristol Smooth. You can get a, 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 a Bristol board uh, in a surface called vellum as well, which is a slightly rougher um, tooth to the paper. Uh, but I do like this smooth one, particularly if we're going to be trying to draw this very shiny reflective surface that we have here. Um, the vellum is, like I say, it's slightly toothier. And if you're trying to go for a skin texture or something that has a organic sort of texture to it, maybe a wooden surface or a material, then the vellum's a really lovely paper as well. It just holds on to the pencil a little bit more and just allows you to work the tooth of the paper slightly more than the, the smooth. This smooth bristol is also very, very good for using ink on. So, uh, I, I, like I say, I, I went through a stage where I did a lot of cartoon work using a lot of my coloured markers. And uh, this is, again, it's a, it's a very versatile paper again you can get that from Amazon I guess you can get everything from Amazon nowadays so come go and join the group it's called tutorial Tuesdays beginner to pro you can find a link to that down in the descriptions below the video don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel We've had a lot of new members to the group and obviously a lot of new subscribers to the channel recently. So thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate it. Um, I never for once thought that we'd have, there's nearly 4,000 subscribers to the channel now. And uh, we've got, you know, about 3,000 people in our Facebook group. So it's really lovely to uh, to see that number going up and just to realize that actually there are people out there that are finding what I'm putting together useful because it's always a, I wouldn't say it's a worry, but trying to put something together that makes sense not only to yourself but to other people sometimes can be more difficult than, than it seems. And although I understand what's going on in my head and, and the processes that I'm going through, actually trying to convey that to other people can sometimes be more difficult than, than you think. But um you know, the reaction from most people is it's all been quite positive and it's been fantastic. It's it's wonderful seeing people from around the world posting their work on Instagram or their other social media and uh, and, and seeing, you know, one of the projects that we put together, you know, something that's been conceived by, you know, it's come out of my head. I've looked at reference images and had a go at certain things and then put together the tutorials and people have obviously 
followed them to the end and they've created something that's virtually identical to what I've done, which is, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, if you're on Instagram or any of the social media, then don't forget, leave me a comment down below. Uh, I'll tend to follow back if, if you've come through the group and whatnot. Just leave me a message. Uh, you can get me at ArtisticN1K. It's the same handle as the YouTube channel. And like I say, the Facebook group that I'm running is called Tutorial Tuesdays Beginners to Pro. My aim was to release one tutorial video once a week on Tuesdays. Uh, but I'm currently doing two a week. It's just that I've had a few people in the group with me from the start and they've sort of kept up with all of the projects we've done. I'd say we're on our seventh or eighth project now. And uh, I just like to keep the videos coming out and I enjoy drawing. So whenever I do get half an hour to spare, I do uh, try and put pencil to paper. So we can see we've got a, a large coverage in here. This is this is probably the largest area that we're going to have to cover. And I'm not pressing on too hard. If I want more value, I just go over the same area a few more times. And I'm trying to keep the strokes of my pencil as close together as possible. I don't want big gaps in between each stroke. I don't want lots of white paper showing through. Those of you that have been with me for any amount of time now, or have watched any of my videos, you will know that I really have about three things that I really stress and, and keep talking about in all of my videos. If you're trying to create realism, which is hopefully why you're here, uh, if you're into cartoon work, this is perhaps not the, the type of tutorial. However, it was going through this process of learning how to draw this way that then allowed me to turn my hand to doing cartoon work because the rules are exactly the same. So the first rule is you, you must get the, the rules of light correct. And, and what I mean by that is if you look at anything in real life, the further away something is from the light source, the darker it becomes. So for example, these dark areas here, they're holes. Our brain is interpreting them as holes. We know that this is a air intake and it's black because the light is unable to get into that area, which creates a shadow. Now, everything obeys or sticks to that, that rule, that rule of thumb. So if we have something that's white, Within those white areas, there will be darker areas that are going away from the light. It's how we create depth and dimension, and that's what we want. We want to be able to convey the message that what we're looking at has an, a, a, an angle to it, a soft edge, a hard edge. A clean edge is what I call it. This is a clean edge here to value. This is the end of my value there. This value is separate from this. Whereas if we if we had a rounded part to it. I would soften that edge up and I wouldn't make it quite as harsh. But ultimately what I'm doing is I'm copying directly from the reference. And that's the effect that we have there. So that's what we're going to try and recreate with our drawing. Okay. So the second thing I'm going to come into this this air intake now. Uh, the next thing for creating realism that I think is absolutely vital is contrast. The more contrast you can have within your drawing, the more realism you're going to create. So the contrast, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about two different types of contrast really. It's the contrast between your values. So within this drawing, we've already identified where the darkest zones are and we're starting with those. But we also need to know where the lightest areas are, particularly on these reflections. So if you look at your reference image, there is actually some areas on there that are almost white. Now our job is to keep ramping up the contrast. So keep working on the darkest areas, bringing the value up in those areas whilst protecting and really trying to protect the 
lightest areas. Usually when we're doing a portrait, the lightest area and the one that is the most important to create realism is that sparkle in the eye. The reflection in your portrait's eye. So if you've done any of my portraits with me, uh, the last one we did was the dog portrait, uh, the portrait of Myla. And the eyes were the sort of centerpiece of the drawing. That was the standout part of the drawing that I wanted to really represent and represent well. Well, as you noticed, as we went through the project, I was constantly cleaning up that white of the eye because I wanted that to be in stark contrast to the pupil. So working out where your lightest areas are and where your darkest areas are, that is absolutely crucial. Then what we need to have is we need to have smooth transitions from one value to another. There's nothing worse than seeing somebody that's done a fantastic job with their proportions. They've got some lovely contrast in their work, but it's just ruined because they've not quite blended the values together. So we, we end up with this kind of streaky looking piece of work. Now, there are some techniques and one of them is called cross hatching where you have this slightly unfinished look to it and, and it can look fantastic but does it look realistic? Possibly not and that's probably not the artist's intention. You can have something that does look realistic but if it is this cross hatchy type of effect it doesn't look ultra realistic, it doesn't look like a photograph and what we're aiming for with this style of drawing is we're trying to get something that looks like a photograph certainly what I, what caught my eye when I first started drawing I, I was taken by portraits realistic portraits these photo realistic and hyper realistic portraits were were really what I wanted to try and achieve with my work so if that's what you're going for then the smooth transitions the contrast between the values are very important and then obviously the the third thing is making sure that your drawing is accurate so the sizes are correct and the proportions are right things are in the right place if you watch lesson one where we use the grid method to plot this out you'll notice the huge mistake that I made in the positioning of this wing mirror now had I not have noticed that and just carried on would have had a drawing that had contrast, would have had a drawing that had got smooth value changes, but because the placement of something was wrong, it would have looked off. Particularly if I was drawing this for somebody. Um, I've done a few commissions before of people that are really into their cars. Um, I've done a couple of commissions for a pilot. So I've done a few aeroplanes as well. Now, believe me you, if you have somebody that's fanatical about their vehicle, they know where every rivet, every bolt, every single angle is. And if you get that wrong, boy, are they going to tell you. I remember working on a plane for a pilot and I must have had to have made 50 revisions with it. You know, only slight things, but each time I took what I believed was almost a completed piece of work, I always ended up having to just finish something or get the positioning of something else that wasn't quite there. So again, I've got this very dark reflection in this window area. Got a few details in there. Now when we're drawing reflections, it's very important that you do get this stark contrast between where the light's hitting and the, the shadowed areas. So if you actually look on the glass, you know, you've got some very deep blacks in there. But you've also got 
sort of directly next to it, which you don't get with any other real material other than shiny objects. Nothing that I've come across anyway. You don't get this directly next to it, going from black straight into a white. And it's capturing those, those points that are vital when we're trying to draw something that looks shiny. Okay, I'm going to move the paper around now. This is one of my all-time tips for you. Do not be afraid to move your paper around. So I'm going to work in this dark shadowed area. Again, this is on the glass. Now what, what they are, th these will probably be objects that are in the room that are being reflected back into the glass. So sometimes it's okay and you can work things out but I can't quite work out what they are I guess they're just structures within the room but that's the dark patches they're ultimately shadows and then the light areas could be the light source in the room they could be windows that are placed around the room but nevertheless we need to create that contrast and as you'll notice as we look down the window we've got shadows of, of varying different values so with some of those lighter ones what we will do is we'll go in with the 2H pencil and we'll get a nice fine coverage and then we'll start layering the 2B pencil over some of this HB. What we're doing is we're working with a grayscale, which is ultimately what a black and white photograph is. It goes from the one end we're working in the black, the black zone all the way up to the white and everything in between is a different level of grey. That's why graphite work is so perfectly fitted for working in black and white because each of your pencils gives you a different value. So the, the harder the pencils, so the high number H's, a 9H for example, will give you a very, very, very light stroke of the pencil you will not be able to get a huge amount of value with a 9H. Now at the other end of the spectrum, a 9B, we're absolutely going to have a big value change. So there's going to be, you know, it's going to be almost a black. A 9B is almost a black. And everything in between is a slightly darker or slightly lighter depending on which direction you're moving up or down the scale. So we've just got a little detail in there that I wanted to add in. So you can start to see now that we are getting uh, some of these I don't know which way to orient this paper, just so that you can see it. I'm, I'm going to have a look at some of this reflection now. This dark shadow on the glass itself again. Now, I did spend quite a bit of time after I'd plotted the main areas of our car out, just looking at some of these details, some of these reflections and shadows because again I think that like with the dog I think it's going to be the reflections on this that are going to be the centerpiece yes the car's lovely it's a fantastically aerodynamic shape and it's actually a lovely red color uh, the image that I that I had is is in a is in colour and it's a beautiful red colour as you would expect a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Again, I'm not 100% certain. I'm not the world's biggest 
sports car fan but th this back end here does does have the look about it of a Lamborghini and I think possibly the wing mirror too I have got a friend that owns a few Lamborghinis um, he's a very wealthy chap and I will next time I see him I'll show him the photograph of this and ask him he'll tell me straight away what car this is and what model it is but coming back to the point of what I was saying it's not the shape of the car or the car itself that's going to be the, the focal point it's the reflections you know this could have easily have been the reflections on a pond or the reflections on a metal ball or something like that it was the like I say it was the reflections that caught my eye so I don't see it as we're drawing a car what we're doing is we're trying to create a reflective surface that just so happens to be on a very expensive looking car I bet this car doesn't go out in the rain very often. It kind of ruins the look of it, doesn't it? If uh, if you saw one of these driving past you on a wet, muddy, one of those days that they're, they're usually, well, they're almost exclusively in the winter when you've had a series of wet days and you're stuck behind a heavy vehicle, a lorry or a tractor or something and it's just covering your car in this fine mud. Imagine being in this vehicle. Because I would guess that you're not just going to go and take this to the local automatic car wash and pay £2.99 for a quick rinse. It's going to be a... Uh, it's going to be an expensive valet or certainly a hand car wash because you don't want to be chipping the paint on this uh, on this machine so I'm just being very careful to make sure that I'm keeping these strokes as close together as I can if I feel that I've missed out a, a line or two I'm going back over that and I'm just getting a very fine layer of graphite this technique that I'm teaching you does require a little bit more patience I'm pretty sure that if we'd have just started with a 6B pencil and a blending stump we'd have had this area we'd have had all the dark areas done by now the problem is once you've used that blending stump and you've ground that graphite down into the tooth of the paper you are unable to take the graphite out you've damaged the tooth of the paper call it burnishing and if you've done any work with a set of colored pencils prismacolor pencils are extremely soft and to get some realistic skin tones and things like that what we do is we do exactly what I said we burnish so you'll get a you'll put a fine layer of colored pencil down in one tone you'll add some of the darker colors in there as well and then what you do some some artists use a white or a very very neutral color and you in generally in a circular motion you really grind the wax together and it creates almost it binds it together and it almost looks like an oil painting it almost looks like you're working in a, like an oil and that really does give you a 
very very different look to what we're creating with this pencil the other reason that i am hesitant to use a blending stump is we we tend to avoid something called graphite shine if we can stay away from the blending tools graphite shine occurs because when we drag the paper uh, sorry the pencil over the paper the fine particles of graphite that come off of the pencil lead are extremely smooth they've got a reflective quality to them and they all sit very very flat so by pushing them down you're just enhancing that quality of the graphite it's why a lot of people like to use charcoal but with the method I'm teaching you if we do go through this layering process what happens is we are we're able to get a very rich tone, a very rich, deep value without the risk of embedding the graphite down and pushing it so that it's all completely flat and having this very unrealistic reflective quality to it. And, you know, from some angles, sometimes your drawings look okay, but it only takes a slight difference in viewing position. to get this dreaded gra graphite shine and it just it just really ruins the in my eyes it, it ruins the piece and what you'll also notice is we've uh, we've done a good few thousand strokes now for sure with this pencil on this video and um, I haven't sharpened yet because I'm using this tapered stroke and what you'll also notice is I'm holding the pencil quite a long way away from the tip of the pencil. Now what that does is that puts my pencil tip at a very, very, almost a flat angle towards the paper. And every few strokes, I'm just turning the pencil. And what this does is it does something called self sharpens. So as I wear the edge away at an angle, I then turn the pencil and it wears away the opposite side or the, the, the side next to the one that I was using before. And this process over time just keeps your pencil nice and sharp, which does two things for you. It uh, saves time it also saves you money as I mentioned these are the Caran d'Ache Graphwood pencil series they're not cheap I think they were 20 pounds 25 pounds something like that for the set I think it went from I think it went from a 9h to a 9b or certainly in a 7b in there um, and although it's not the most expensive pastime, you know, it's not a, it's not on the same level as somebody that decides that skiing's their thing. You know, they're spending hundreds and hundreds of pounds on new bits and bobs or golf. A few sheets of paper and some pencils and you're away. However, if we can save a little bit of money in the process and a bit of time, then it's win-win. I'm just being careful not to press on too hard. I'm just letting the pencil do the work. If I don't have the right value on the first pass over a certain area, I go back and I start again. Now, by turning the paper as well, what we do is we do get our pencil strokes to lie in different directions. Now, I've been doing this stroke for many years now. I've done millions and millions of them, so I'm quite good at keeping the the space between the, the lines down to a minimum. But when you first start out with this technique, 
if you're not crisscrossing your lines, so turning the paper so that your lines aren't all sitting in the same direction, you end up with this very streaky, very liney, almost looking like chicken scratches on the page. So until you've sort of mastered your stroke, I would really advise turning your paper as much as you can so that you have got a much smoother coverage. The other thing that turning your paper around is it gives your brain a, a new look at things, a new look at angles, a new look at details. And I've spotted most of my mistakes with pieces of work I won't call them mistakes, but areas that I need to make a slight alteration most of the time have come from looking at my drawing at a different angle. Sometimes taking a photograph of your work with maybe a smartphone and having a look at your actual image on a screen sometimes can highlight areas that you were unable to see with the naked eye. So I'm looking at the time now when we've sort of crossed that 30 minute mark. I like to try and keep these videos down to about 30 minutes. Um, what I'm going to continue to do, and I think you've got the general gist of this, is I'm going to go around the drawing and I'm just going to pick out these very, very dark areas. I'm going to cover my dark areas with the HB pencil in exactly the same way that I've been talking you through for the last 30 minutes. Make sure that you're not pressing on too hard. We're not going to the extent that of this pencil, the value that we could get with it. If I pressed on hard now, I could get a very, very dark line with it. But that is going to damage the tooth of the paper. So go around your drawing, just find those darkest zones. Take your time, try and perfect that, perfect that stroke. Keep the strokes close together. And have fun with it. Don't get bogged down in the details. Work one area move on to the next, work one area, move on to the next. And um, I'll see you in the next video. Don't forget to post your progress. If you've got some questions, <coughs> let me know over on the group. There's also some fantastic artists in the group as well that can give you some advice. I'm going to continue for another half an hour or so, I would say, on this. That will probably give me enough time to get these major dark areas in. Um, and I'll sort of be happy with that and to, to move on to the next stage. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, it's been a pleasure drawing with you again. I'll see you in the next video. Uh, I'll see you over in the group as well. Thanks a lot. Hit subscribe, smack the notifications button, follow me on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.